So the uh, last speaker uh, of this session uh, is uh, Kim Clemson. Uh, Clemson. No, 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 there's, an, there's, there's just the missing in. It's a, also was, a very long yeah. name. <laughs> it's a very long name. Yeah, the, yeah. The Clemson, that would be the Danish pronunciation. Yeah. Um, and uh, it is uh, Kim is from uh, Novo Nordisk uh, as well, and of course part of the joint initiative for causal inference. And she will talk on generalizability and transportability in the context of target trial uh, emulation. Uh, and just to uh, advocate, uh, advertise a little bit, Kim and I are also giving a talk on sort of a similar topic at the Dia China, which hopefully uh, will uh, take place in December, I believe, uh, Corona permitting. But uh, yes, thank you so much for letting me uh, present here today. And uh, as Thais just alluded to, I'll talk about generalizability and transportability uh, in the context of tag trial emulations. So just a little bit on me, I have to, uh, I'm a medical doctor. So this is also in PowerPoint <laughs> and, um, and not in Beamer. I'm currently a postdoc at uh, Novo Nordisk, uh, but it's a postdoc, there's a collaboration between Copenhagen University and Steno Diabetes Center Copenhagen um, in Denmark, uh, which is a diabetes hospital with uh, a lot of research going on as well. And then, of course, I'm uh, so privileged to be involved in the joint initiative for causal inference. So today I will give a little bit about the background of what I, um, what, why I'm here and talking today and what I would like to focus on, which is not so uh, much the stats part, but more the clinical part. Then talk a little bit about the uh, generalizability and transportability, and then how we can uh, use this target trial approach that has been uh, proposed by uh, Hernan and uh, Robbins uh, in a very nice paper from 2016. And then I would also like uh, to give an example of a target trial emulation that we are currently uh, conducting uh, at Novo Nordisk together with um, Copenhagen University. So it's actually mostly Copenhagen University who, has, who are doing all this that part. So as from my, from my seat as a medical doctor, what I really want is I want evidence that can guide my clinical decisions. And these are becoming even more complex as more treatments are becoming available, which is of course wonderful, but also making the job somewhat uh, more difficult. Then as an MD, I'm also very interested in, could we maybe answer our questions faster and for a wider range of populations than we would normally be able to do if we simply are focused on the randomized controlled trials, which of course takes a longer time to get because you need to get the people involved in the trial and it takes a longer time of follow-up. And then lastly, of course, we want to see whether we could also translate this evidence that we have from randomized controlled trials and put them into the real world where we are actually seeing our patients, which Lauren has also alluded to with, the, um, the, with her thoughts about that we usually see that people who are actually in a randomized trials are somewhat different than the normal clinical population that we see. And we also see that the placebo groups fare better than our um, other patients. And then of course, we also want to translate the evidence into the target population that the specific MD is actually interested in, um, in treating. So just a little bit about uh, what, from my point of view, when I'm saying generalizability and transposability, what I'm actually uh, talking about. So here um, on the left side, I brought this from a, a very nice uh, paper. Um, we have the context where we are in the generalizability context, we have the target population, and then the randomized controlled trial population, actually a nested part of this target population. So we have drawn a sample from the target population. So the target population being the population that we are actually interested in getting some evidence on the treatments effects in. So in that way, we are able to actually generalize from our trial sample into our target sample. 
then things get uh, somewhat more complicated when we move into transportability. Here we are in a, another setup. We have like a superpopulation that could be the whole population of a country, for instance, or the world if we are going really um, high up. And then we have from that we have the trial population and the target populations, but they are no longer nested in each other. It could, for example, be that the trial populations is only people between the age of 50 50 and 70, whereas the target population, the population of interest is perhaps people above 70. And in that case, we are in a more difficult place where, when we want to transport our uh, evidence from the trial population onto our target population. So putting in, in maybe a little bit more of an MD wording, when we really want to answer clinical relevant questions on the drug use in real world data, then we want to take and generalize the data that we get from the RCT sample and into our target population, because we know that there are differences between the people who have actually been sampled and put into a randomized control trial and the rest of the population. And we also are, of course, interested in also transporting to populations that were not included in randomized control trials for a lot of different reasons. So what do we actually do when we want to answer these questions? As I also touched upon previously, then, of course, the gold standard will be do a randomized control trial because we know that with a relevant and well-executed randomized trial, we should be able to answer our causal question on comparative effectiveness and harm of a specific treatment. However, this is in no way always possible. It, can, it is really, really expensive. It can in some cases be unethical. It takes a really long time. And we can also be in a space where it's simply not feasible to actually um, recruit the patients needed for the specific trial. So what can we then do? Of course, there's a multiple uh, of, uh, of things that uh, we could possibly do to move this along. But as uh, I'm talking about the uh, target trial emulations today, then of course, this is what I, um, I will propose that we actually do. So we want to do, uh, we want to use this uh, framework of the target trial, where we say that if we formalize and think about a hypothetical randomized trial that we could conduct to answer our causal question, then we can afterwards, when we have really thought about it, we have made sure that if we were actually able to do this and conduct this trial, it would actually answer our question. In that way, we also forced into actually thinking whether the question that we are proposing is in fact a causal question that is possible to answer. And when we have then done this and put down like what is our hypothetical randomized trial, then we can see the causal analysis of observational data as an attempt to actually emulate the target trial in our observational data set. So in that way, it really puts the causal question up front and makes and hopefully makes us sure that we are actually looking at it in that way. And again, then if we are not actually able to translate our causal question into a target trial, then we have to go back because then our question is simply not well defined yet. So what are some of the benefits uh, of using uh, this setup uh, by uh, Renan and uh, Robbins is that we are actually in a nice way able to answer causal questions with our real world data by making the study design very explicit, making sure that we are not by mistake having immortal time bias and we make sure that our two um, groups are actually comparable. And then hopefully we will be able to actually answer causal questions that are unlikely to be answered with an RCT due to all the reasons I listed before with expense uh, uh, being too expensive, taking too long a time, etc. So, and then I think a, a last point is also that we need to be able to communicate our results to the clinicians. And clinicians are really used to 
getting their knowledge from randomized controlled trials. And most clinicians, of course, there are some who are very much into stats, but a, a lot of uh, medical practicing medical doctors are, are mostly medical doctors. So um, it is nice to get the results in a way that uh, we are actually used to. So I will just give a short example again here with the leader trial, which uh, both Edwin and uh, Lauren has also alluded to, which was a cardiovascular outcome trial of liraglutide um, in individuals with type 2 diabetes. And it's not that you need to really read the results I put up here, but it's just like as an MD, you would usually start up with some baseline characteristics being kind of like can are these uh, individuals in the trial, are they kind of similar to the patients I see in my clinic? And does the two groups seem to be balanced? And then we get as the primary outcome, a nice table where we can see the number of patients with an event. We can see how many were actually at risk at the different time points. And then we get our hazard ratio with all the problems uh, of interpretive that hazard ratios has, but at least this is something that the most clinicians are used to looking at. So then using this uh, target trial um, approach, you can actually kind of make your observational analysis in a way so you get results that are similar to the results that you see from your randomized controlled trials. And here I'll just uh, point to a a very interesting in, uh, initiative, the RCT Duplicate Initiative, which is a collaboration between uh, Howard and FDA and others, where they have set out uh, emulating randomized clinical trials that have actually been uh, performed in the real world, also including uh, the LEADER trial that we have uh, already talked about. Um, and then here I'll just show some of the results um, from that. And as you as you can see here, we actually end up with something that looks kind of like the results that we saw from the original leader trial. And in this way, we can also make sure that we are finding somewhat similar results to those that we have seen uh, in the randomized control trial setting, which again makes us more sure that we can actually trust these um, observational data analysis. So here you, they have in the RCT duplicate made it uh, made these emulations for a wide range of, um, of trials, but here I've just put in the leader trial where they then have this uh, table one where you again can see like what is the baseline characteristics for the patients included. And then maybe most what I really in, uh, like, then we have this uh, figure that is really kind of the same as we have seen um, in the original leader uh, trial, where we have the numbers at risk. Uh, and then the, here they're using an active comparator as you are not uh, able to uh, have a placebo group in the in real world data, which of course, would have been nice, but it's not a possibility. And then we can see that they show the, again, the graphs with the patients with an event and where we can, they both have in the graph from the real leader data up here, the real RCT, and then the real world uh, data down here. And we can see that they look similar, albeit with a somewhat uh, lower event rate, which we would probably also uh, expect due to selection into the trial. Yeah. So with that, I would like to move on to an example where we are trying uh, to apply uh, this method to study the effect of dual therapy with GLP-1 and SGLT-2. And I will start off um, with a little bit of, uh, as this is a stat conference, I'll just say two words about uh, type 2 diabetes and some of the treatments uh, that we use in this space, because I believe it is very important that we also get this subject um, meta knowledge in. So we are actually asking questions that are also uh, relevant in the, the clinical uh, space. So type two diabetes uh, is a situation where individuals have uh, blood glucose levels that are higher than normal. The body is no longer reacting appropriately to insulin. It has insulin resistance. So even though the pancreas is secreting insulin, it is no longer possible to keep the blood sugar levels uh, at the right um, uh, 
place. And then there's also a de different degrees of insulin deficiency as of where the body, especially when further along in the disease, are no longer able to really um, produce enough insulin. And then due to a uh, Bella, due to a uh, lifestyle, um, westernized lifestyle, we see an increasing prevalence of type 2 diabetes as big risk factors for type 2 diabetes is uh, lack of exercise and um, obesity. When we want to treat type 2 diabetes, we will often um, in the medical setting, of course, depending on uh, how far and, and how uh, severe their diseases, we will start with lifestyle uh, changes and then uh, move on uh, to medication. And lifestyle changes is, of course, really hard uh, to find in, in real world data. It is not so, um, so often that it is put into uh, databases and registries, while on the other hand, medications uh, are somewhat more uh, accessible. And then moving on to talk a little bit about this medication, which um, it was also part of uh, Edwin's talk, but I'll just say a little bit uh, more on it, where uh, the GLP-1, which stands for glucagon-like peptide 1 agonist. Glucagon-like peptide 1 is a, a hormone that we excrete in, in our guts, and it's a part of uh, our everyday living. And, it, um, and taking these uh, GLP-1 agonists actually leads to a reduced appetite and craving for food and also improved control of eating, which again leads to reduced energy intake, which again leads to a reduced uh, body weight. And this, um, and this drug has some very nice effects on the metabolic system and also cardiovascular benefits. And then we have the SGLT2, uh, which was the drop-in drug in uh, Edwin's uh, presentation um, about the SOL trial. This stands for sodium glucose transporter 2 inhibitor. And the sodium glucose transporter 2 is a, a transporter of uh, sodium and glucose located in the kidneys. And when we inhibit this, then we increase the glucose excretion via the kidneys. So how much glucose ends up in the urine. And by this, we will get a lower plasma glucose and also a reduced body weight due to loss of uh, energy through the urine. And SGLT2 has also been shown to have a nice CV benefit. So then you also need to know a little bit about how we think about these different treatments for type 2 diabetes, and there's actually coming new guidelines very soon. But for the study that we are looking into now, um, we see the first line treatment as being metformin, as most patients, at least in Denmark, start out here. And then we have some second line treatments if metformin is not enough to control uh, the individual's diabetes. And that is GLP-1 and SGLT-2, which is the two drugs of interest uh, for this particular project. Um, uh, but then we also have DPP-4s and uh, SUs and T uh, tso lipidiones. And then in our setting, we are thinking about insulin as a third line treatment, but that's not always how you see uh, insulin. So then actually moving on to the, to, the, to the example, the study that we want to do is that we want to generate evidence on the added benefit of treating with both an SGLT1 and a GLP-1 receptor antagonist instead of only being treated with one of them. And this is unlikely to be a uh, a study that is going to as a, a randomized controlled trial. So here we kind of have to rely on um, observational data to get this evidence. We believe that the, we would find added benefits of being treated with both as they have different modes of actions. And then we also see that there's continuously new data being published for both drug classes. And also um, trial, also studies where they want to try and see how this dual treatment actually works out. But many of those has issues with immortal time bias as they look at the last treatment regime individuals end up on and start follow up from that. But then you have a very different set of uh, patients in the different groups. Yeah. So what we are going to do is that we are going to um, take uh, take advantage of the very nice uh, Danish and UK registry data 
um, at least, and for Denmark, this is actually uh, nationwide. And then we're going to have a study population which consists of type 2 uh, individuals with type 2 diabetes who have progressed to the second line, second, second line antihyperglycemic drug therapies. And that's what is really important. We want to compare uh, people who are actually comparable. So we want to compare groups where they have both progressed to not, not only needing something additional to metformin, which is the first line therapy, but actually needing two different drugs from the second um, line treatment. They have to be adults. And then of course we have a, a somewhat long list of exclusion criteria, which in sake of time, uh, I will not go into here. And then we will start the follow-up period as the time of the second second line treatment, and then follow them until the end of uh, year 2021, where we have uh, due to data availability. So we, in this case, are going to categorize the exposure time into individuals being on a GLP-1 and together with an SGLT-2 being on a GLP-1 and any of the other uh, second line treatments being on an SGLT-2 and any of the other second line treatments and then being just on two of the other uh, second line treatments. So what we are really interested uh, to investigate in, in this trial is that we want to uh, compare being on both SGLT1 and GLP1 to being on either of uh, the mono component together with any of the other second line treatments. So this is maybe a, a, a little busy, but um, this is just trying to summarize the protocol for our hypothetical trial. That'd be if we were actually to go out and, and make a randomized controlled trial um, to, to answer our um, course of question on the dual therapy of um, GLP-1 and SGLT-2. And then you can see it's very much uh, kind of the same, at least with the eligibility criteria, where we have individuals with type 2 diabetes, which I also alluded to on the slide uh, previously. And then we have that they initiated an additional treatment with either GLP-1, SGLT-2, or any of, of the remaining uh, second line therapies. And then that they start at baseline and then remain on into doing follow-up. And then as the assignment procedure in this hypothetical trial, participants will be randomly assigned to any one of the strategies at baseline, and then they will be aware of the strategy to which they have been assigned. So it's a pragmatic trial. And that's also important that it's a lot easier to emulate a pragmatic trial because of course in observational data, there is no placebo, there is no double blindness. People know what they're getting and their provider also know what they are being treated with. Then it's very important to be sure that you have time zero, right? To make sure that you don't end up having, for instance, immortal time bias. And here in the hypothetical trial, it will be the start um, of the assignment, and then we will be following up until the outcome, de death, loss to follow up, or administration follow up. And then the primary outcome will be first time heart failure hospitalization following inclusion. And our causal interests of um, contrast of interest is intention to treat a PrEP protocol. And then, of course, there's no space to actually put in an analysis, an analysis plan here, but you would, of course, have to actually write that up. If you, when you are actually doing uh, the study. So then looking at how we then uh, translate this into our trial emulation, then the eligibility criteria will stay the same, the same with the treatment strategies. But then the assignment procedure is of course different because there is no randomization here. So then instead we assume randomization conditional on a long list of baseline covariates, um, which, like age, sex, what first line, second line of treatment they were on, and so forth. And then time zero would be the same as for the target trial. 
the same as with the outcome. But then the causal interest, uh, contrast of interest is instead the observational analog of the pre-protocol effect. And then, which <laughs> we have also heard about today, we will uh, apply longitudinal targeted maximum likelihood estimation, albeit uh, I have, uh, don't have time to actually going into details here. So, what can we so some what are some of these perspectives on this? I believe and we believe that target trial emulations can be very useful in answering clinically relevant questions using real world data, especially because you are very much forced to actually get your question right in the first place. And then we hope that we in this way also can be better at actually getting evidence for hard to reach populations that are not included in our randomized controlled trials. And then evidence in a form that is maybe easier to understand for clinicians that are used to be informed by randomized controlled trials. So with that, I would like to say thank you for listening and we'll be happy to take any questions if there are some. Thank you, Kim. Uh, any questions? I have a, a, a question, to, mm -hmm. which is, uh, when you think of target Im trial emulation, do you see it mostly as a statistical method or do you see it as a communication device? I might, due to being an MD, I actually see it very much as also a communicational device, where you actually, you're kind of forced to think about it in a way where you have to put it in a, put it in an approach where you're actually able to explain what you're doing to someone who are used to the randomized control trials. Mm -hmm. Because often I think MDs can get a, a lot, at least I can, I can of course only speak on my own behalf. We can get a little bit lost uh, with all the equations and all these assumptions and so forth. And of course there are, as I said, it's so, so important, but sometimes you also need to get some get evidence from something that you can feel like you actually understand what is going on. So, of course, it is very much a statistical approach as well, but I also see it as a, a way of uh, making your observational tri uh, studies more like easy to follow uh, for, for individuals who are, are maybe not that um, mm. hardcore in statistics. Yeah, yeah. I, I share it, and I think it's maybe important to say to statisticians that when when the words are used like this, instead of saying, oh, we want to match on these or that, or we want, you know, it yeah. could have been phrased differently, then yeah. it is because we are thinking about a slightly alternative end user audience. Uh, maybe you should unshare, please. Yeah. Uh, it's a very large logo. Uh, <laughs> um, then any uh, other questions? If not, then I would like, first of all, to thank all the speakers. And then I would invite uh, the, uh, the speakers uh, to unmute the video or, or, uh, because then we can take uh, a picture, which is, of course will just be a picture of a, um, of a Zoom screen, but still it showed us a little bit. And then we can uh, think about how wonderful it will be if maybe next year or the year after uh, the, the Pacific Coast Linference Conference would be in person. Um, fingers crossed. Uh, okay, uh, who, are, who is the picture taker? Okay. Yeah? Another. You got it? <laughs> okay. Okay, you start. Perfect, thank you. Well, thank you everybody uh, and uh, see you at the next sessions or um, yeah, bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you everyone.